Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Tariq Isaacs. I am a Whaler One man from Canaveral and an engagement assistant at the Matilda Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use, located at University of Sydney for the Cracks in the Ice online toolkit. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's Cracks in the Ice webinar. Before we begin our webinar, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and culture. I am currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on and pay respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are amongst us today. Today's presentation is one in a series of webinars, which is running as part of the Cracks in the Ice project. If you haven't already seen the website, I would encourage you to visit www.cracksintheice.org.au and we welcome any comments or questions you may have. So feel free to get in touch with us at any time. Before I introduce you to today's speakers, I wanted to let you all know that as participants, you are in listen only mode. And this means that we can't see or hear you. However, you will notice that you have a Q&A button on your dashboard. This is where you can type in questions that you have during the webinar and send them through to us. We will then have a question and answer section at the end of the webinar. I would like to let you know that that we will be recording the session today and we will be making the recording as well as, as well as the slides available to you through the Cracks in the Ice website. We have two speakers today, Professor James Ward and Dr. Rachel Riley. Professor James Ward is a Pitt Jinjala and Nakuna man, an infectious disease epidemiologist and a national leader in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research. He is currently the, the director of the Poach Center of Indigenous Health at the University of Queensland, holding various roles over the last 25 years in Aboriginal public health policy for both government and non-government organizations. In urban, regional and remote communities, he has built a national program of research in epidemiology and prevention of infectious diseases. With a particular focus on STIs, HIV, and viral hepatitis in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Professor Ward has previously worked at the Kirby Institute, University of New South Wales, Baker IDI in Alice Springs, and South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, or SAMI. He has served on numerous national and international committee, committees, including currently the Communicable Diseases Network of Australia the Australian National Council on Alcohol and Drugs, the CDNA COVID-19 Working Group, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander COVID-19 Task Force. He has over 120 publications and leads several large-scale public health and infectious diseases studies. Our other speaker, Dr. Rachel Riley, is a health psychologist and senior research fellow in the Aboriginal Health Equality Unit at SAMI. She has been conducting collaborative research in Aboriginal health for almost 20 years alongside clinical practice in a range of settings. The consistent underlying theme of Rachel's work has been exploration of links between social, emotional, and physical well being, and finding culturally relevant assessment and intervention approaches at individual and community levels to improve health outcomes. Thank you both for joining us. We are extremely lucky to have you with us today. And I'm sure this is going to be an interesting. I will now hand you over to make the presentation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Tariq, and uh, and thanks very much to the Cracks and the Ice team uh, for the invitation for both Rachel and myself to present today. Um, on and uh, our brief today is really to reflect on how we work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Uh, both Rachel and I um, are colleagues. We have worked together at the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute and Rachel uh, will present on a study uh, that I lead that's been funded by the NHMRC uh, at the end of this presentation. 
Before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge country. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners on the many lands where we're all meeting today and, and dialing in from, recognise their custodianship of the land and waterways where we're meeting and pay my respects to the ancestors of these lands and, uh, and, uh, and elders and, uh, and young people who are coming through on those countries. Uh, at the University of Queensland, we recognise the valuable contributions that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have made uh, to this country. Um, in terms of the presentation today, I'll um, present for about 20 minutes, then Rachel will present for 20 minutes, and then there'll be some time for questions. But I, during my presentation, I wanted to really just talk about some general principles of working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, and then issues to think about uh, once you're working with communities. Uh, and I situate myself as a researcher. I um, have been in research for almost two decades now. And, uh, and uh, although there are many program people on here, um, I think many of the principles about working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are relevant, whether you're working in a research environment, whether you're a clinician on the ground or whether you're working in rolling out a uh, program like Cracks in the Ice, uh, for instance, uh, for our peoples. And so um, this first part of my presentation is really about some general principles. And then the second part is really highlighting one of the projects that I've currently got funded as a researcher by the NHMRC, putting in and demonstrating how we put in place the principles of uh, what I've just talked about uh, there in the earlier part of this conversation. So excuse me if I'm telling you to suck eggs. Uh, I want to say that up front. Uh, there might be people on this call who have worked with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities for many years. Uh, these are reflections. And, uh, and I think one of the most important things uh, for working with communities is really about respect. Um, Recognising that many communities um, don't have capacity to participate in studies or projects at this point in time. Recognising that and respecting that recognising that communities have their own governance processes in place, they have their own boards and uh, directors in place who set priorities and uh, in a very self-determining way, um, uh, projects that might be of relevance to their own communities. Recognise that communities have their own sets of priorities and they're governed by a board of directors to be able to uh, deliver on those. Recognise that communities have their own core business. For me as a researcher, often working within tertiary care or primary health care services, recognising that I'm a researcher and that primary care and, uh, and healthcare delivery um, is the paramount business of what, where we wanna to go to. So not always can um, communities have the uh, capacity to participate in, in studies and that's fine. It's about respecting that and making sure um, what we're doing is respectful. And also to be mindful that many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are inundated with lots and lots of requests to undertake partnerships with people that they might not have ever met before, ever worked with. And so it's a really a matter of uh, prioritisation for communities, making sure that those people who approach them uh, sit within their, uh, with the core business of their organisation. Another key um, uh, principle of working with communities is making sure you've got the right consultation underway. If you want to work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, consultation is paramount. You need to consult well, you need to consult widely, you need to do it appropriately. Um, not only at the beginning, but throughout and until after the end of your work with those organisations. You need to respect decisions and governance processes. You need to make sure that you enable time uh, for that consultation process to occur. Um, another principle is about making sure you're involving people on the ground when you're working with communities. Think about who to involve in your project. Think about diversity, gender, Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal, mix of skills, seniority, junior people, um, and making sure you're involving people meaningfully uh, throughout your project. We, the worst thing I can do as a researcher is to be the helicopter researcher, fly in, fly out, and uh, occasionally see people. Um, there's really got to be ongoing and meaningful uh, involvement of communities uh, throughout. Transparency, uh, I see this, I, not uh, so much for myself, but I see this happening all the time where, um, where people are not so transparent about what, what their purposes are. It's okay to be an academic and a researcher and, uh, and want to do good for Aboriginal communities, but I think uh, whose benefit are we really in there for? And uh, this is what often is not very transparent. At the beginning of, uh, of some studies that I've been involved in, uh, 
uh, over the years, um, whose benefit is this um, most? So um, if you're gonna work with communities, I think uh, transparency about the funding arrangements you have, the funding agreements you have in place, the agreements you have in place, who are your collaborators, um, what are the expected outputs and benefits for community, and think about what is the sustainability of your work after you've left the, that organisation, if that's the type of nature of work that you are doing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Timeliness is a very important factor, and uh, um, so my only points about this is to make sure you've consulted communities enabled lots of time for those decisions to be made. Often boards will meet um, monthly, uh, boards of uh, Aboriginal health services or Aboriginal organisations will meet monthly or bi-monthly. And sometimes your agenda item will get kicked off because the um, burden of business is, uh, that's required on each of those agenda meetings often means that the um, new business often gets pushed, pushed, pushed back another meeting. So making sure you've got plenty of time um, to work with communities and then, and not coming to communities with a preformed idea about what you need to do um, yeah, before you've sat down and consulted with communities. Um, enabling communities to uh, be flexible in their approach and enabling them to really consider uh, what your proposal is and make sure it fits within their, um, uh, within their timeframe. The other thing I uh, would uh, strongly uh, recommend is making sure you've got some buffer time in your projects. And this is very difficult when you've got a funding agreement, which is, uh, you know, six months or 12 months from our department, for instance, uh, uh, that requires outcomes done within six months or 12 months. That's, they're, just not, they're just not enough time for Aboriginal communities. There are many cultural events. There are many sorry business that uh, interrupts normal business during these periods and uh, enabling you've got some buffer time uh, in, in your project proposal, in your project plan uh, to counter that. Um, appropriateness, I think uh, this is an important thing for many, uh, for me, myself, uh, uh, sometimes I feel like, am I the right person to be in uh, working with this community? Shouldn't, sometimes I ask myself, would it be better if I gave the money directly to communities and asked them to deliver on what we expect as an outcome for them? Because communities do have the answer. So, I think an important thing to ask um, yourself if you're going to work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, are you the right person to be able to do the work? Uh, is the right organisation to be working with? Should an Aboriginal-led and community-based organisation be doing that work? And could the organisation be leading the work with your support? And um, importantly, there are many newly funded uh, agencies, for instance, uh, um, and non-government organisations that are funded by Commonwealth and, and health departments and other agencies to be able to do outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. No track record. Those organisations should really be considering um, are they the right people to be taking money dedicated to improve outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, there are some very well-formed principles about um, privileging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations to be able to deliver on the right things where the government sees that as the priority is the, uh, the bone of contention here, but most times Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and organisations are the best groups uh, to be able to lead and deliver on work that uh, is occurring in their communities. So uh, just be asking people to consider these as, uh, as issues. So once you're working in communities, I always think about these issues here. Um, for me, I feel like, uh, um, <clears throat> It's a, it's a mistake uh, that um, many uh, researchers have made over the years. And one has to question why the status quo of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health outcomes, where I work um, in the area of health, hasn't changed for a long time. And I feel like uh, the system is kind of set up a little bit wrong for us, that we, um, yeah, we um, don't have enough time to really understand the issues on the ground, um, the social cultural issues impacting on our work and what's actually required for a study. Um, that's one issue. Um, the other issue is that in terms of research and in terms of program delivery, research, you can kind of, there, it's a little bit more malleable than a uh, government contract where it is expected to deliver on a set of outcomes. Research is a little bit more malleable that you can change your, uh, the way that you do things based on communities' aspirations, um, whereas government contract is really do this, do this, and we expect this. 
Um, there's a bit more malleability in a research project. But um, the thing that happens in research is that I've realized in the area that I work in is that we're often testing single interventions uh, to address a specific issue, whether it be reducing prevalence of an infection or uh, trying to improve service delivery. We're testing one intervention often, and that's the way research has been set up. Uh, do a randomized trial of this intervention or do this or, or uh, trial this. And, and they're all fine, they all work. They make moderate improvements, but when there's inequality in, in, and inequity uh, persistent in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in terms of health outcomes, we absolutely need to do much better in the way that we fund research and the way that we think about working with communities. Um, what I think we need to do much better about is synergizing these in single interventions together in the one project to make sure that we uh, that everything is working together. It's a bit like systems uh, thinking and systems um, systems thinking. This, if you pull this lever, which one has the biggest impact? If you pull this lever, does it have a bigger impact? But if you put them all together, um, all of those uh, systems hopefully will have a greater impact than what we're currently doing. You only have to look at close the gap uh, for the last uh, fifteen years, and you can see we're still. Uh, 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 you know, um, fledgling in our attempts to try and close the gaps in a whole range of indicators that are set by government. Um, and really what we're trying to do is do single interventions to address very complex um, issues that, are, that have been persistent in communities for a long time and not ever looking at social and structural um, issues behind the scene. Once you have a good handle of social issues that are impacting on what you're potentially going to do with a study or with a uh, project, then you can have much greater output. If you don't have those social, cultural knowledge about where you're working and who you're working with, that makes it much harder to get uh, uh, great impact with these communities. The other thing I would say is about making sure you've got ability to change course. Sometimes uh, things don't go the way they are meant to go. And this is about having good monitoring and evaluation in place. So get ready to go to plan B. If things are not working, make a change um, while you're working. And that I mean, um, often the average time it takes for research to get uh, translated to practice is about 17 years from basic science, so from the lab to, uh, to, um, to community. Um, if you can think about how you do some, pro this is more about a research uh, study, about how you can make change while you're doing research in communities. And then I think we have a much better place. So we don't have time to kind of wait long periods of time after a study's finished to make uh, effective change in our communities. Um, one thing I would say about um, working in communities is think about the potency of your work in communities. By that, I mean the potency of your intervention or the potency of your project. It's all very nice to do a nice project in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and you have nice people and you have nice output and you have nice photos, but actually, is it really going to make a difference to Aboriginal people's futures? Is it making a difference to the longer term? Is it shifting uh, the discourse? Is it shifting prevalence? Is it shifting uh, things along? Are we really making a genuine contribution? I think the more we can um, think about the potency of our work and the synergization of our efforts, um, the greater the chance we'll have of making a difference in our communities. Um, more, again, with research, you can do a research study in uh, under research conditions in communities, but what does that look like in the real life? And think about the fidelity of your work after a study's finished. Does it really, does it fit in real life? And how do you do that while you're working in research? Um, and then finally, making sure you are building capabilities in the organisations you're working with and capacity building of people working in those organisations. They're very uh, general principles, I think, that, that, that I've observed over a very long period of time now, and what we practise in uh, uh, running out uh, projects in communities. I'll just briefly touch on the ending STI project. So this project is a project that is trying to address very high rates of STIs in, um, in two remote areas of Australia, one in the Northern Territory and one in uh, central Queensland. You can see from this slide the prevalence of STIs from 68 communities, a study we did in, uh, in, um, in 2011 was a baseline prevalence, one in four or five young people have an STI any single year in remote communities. And that's far too high to for normal primary health care to bring down um, 
down community prevalence in those in those communities. So the aim of this study, this is a fairly new study, it's been funded for a year and a bit now, um, is my thinking about this study when I wrote it was to the NHMRC was how do we how do we tailor how do we get more how do we, firstly how do we get community more involved in the research projects we're working in, and then how do we synergize our efforts, bring them all together under one project that has enough money to be able to do each aspect of it um, uh, adequately and doesn't make a bigger difference. And that's the whole premise of this uh, uh, project is to, and so I call it precision public health, which is using all the available data sources. So understanding completely what's happening in communities, bringing that all together, synthesizing it, and then sitting down with the community and asking them, these are a set of interventions that might be amenable to making a difference in your community. Um, which of these would you like to choose? Rather than the researcher going in and saying, we'd like to do this study of this, uh, I've flipped research on its head with these two studies. I've got two studies like this, and we're both testing them uh, as we speak now. And so what we've done firstly to involve community more is establish a community coalition up to 30 uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, not the community-based organisations. We've kind of said not everyone from community-based organisations. We want mum and dad, auntie and uncle, young people from communities to be involved in this community coalition. We bring them together, we talk through, we provide training, um, we talk through the study uh, regularly and we um, uh, we pay these people for, the, for being on the community coalition and uh, really make sure that uh, local community members are involved in it because local community members are, uh, are also people who work in health services, but health services are often biased by where they're working and, um, and the organisation they're working in. Um, we involve young people, we provide ongoing training and, uh, and uh, have a whole range of strategies to make sure that the people we're working with um, uh, understand what we're trying to do and they can have a genuine say in the types of interventions when we get to that point in the study. Um, so we're going to bring them along with the whole study to make sure that um, uh, they're involved in every aspect. And when it comes to implementing an intervention, they actually have the last say, uh, rather than me as a researcher, not from that community, saying um, this might be the best research intervention for your group. Um, I'll just quickly go. I think I might be running out of time. So um, basically what we're trying to do here is get um, and th this goes back to my point about understanding what you're working with uh, when you go in. So we're trying to get, um, so when you're talking about STIs, um, we never look at social determinants and the role that they have on STIs. We, so we're gonna gather all of this data up to understand what impact uh, social determinants have over a region. Um, so the last slide was the region I probably skipped over, but there's a region here and this region here in central Queensland. But we're going to have a look at um, as, as micro as we can um, at all the social determinants data. Then we're going to do some interviews with uh, people on the ground about uh, what drives STIs in communities. Then we'll do some genomics, which is a new aspect. We'll sequence gonorrhea, we'll sequence syphilis samples from community samples that are tested positive um, and understand if there are, um, for instance, understand if there's a cluster of uh, gonorrhea in one region, in one aspect, in one little part of the region, rather than doing a full public health approach to addressing gonorrhea, we might need a, only to go to one small community and really put a lot of effort into gonorrhea in that community. So genomics is useful. And then health service data, who's being tested, who's not being tested, how often are people tested, what's the positivity rate. We bring all of that data together and then we bring it to the community coalition and um, this is how we get the data from health services. This is a well-established system. I won't go too much into it. Genomics is a brand new part. Um, behavioral research, we'll talk with uh, both service providers and young people. Uh, and then the local data is this, um, our social determinants data. We've also alcohol outlets and availability um, and all the notification data. Then we synthesize all that data we understand who's greatest, who will, will be able to say to community, who's at greatest risk of SCIs? Are there any hotspots? Are there clusters? Is there transmission patterns happening in communities? What are the drivers of SCIs in these communities? And then the community makes the decision. We will give them a list of interventions that are tried and tested in global settings around the world. And 
talk through those interventions, whether it's a screening program or whether it's a, uh, um, you know, a web-based app or whether it's a behavioural program or whatever. We'll talk through those interventions with community and community will make the decision about where we go to. So um, that's it for me. I'll hand it over to Rachel now and uh, thanks for, and I'll take some questions later on if there are any. Thanks, James. Hi, everyone. So I'll be talking about our second case study um, that hopefully demonstrates some of the really important principles that uh, James outlined uh, in his presentation. Um, I'd firstly like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Narunga land across the water from Adelaide on the beautiful York Peninsula and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and first of all, before I get into the project itself, a big thank you to all the people on the screen who actually rep don't represent everybody that I need to thank um, in relation to this project. Um, in terms of situating myself in this project, I'm a non-Aboriginal researcher with a background in health psychology who started this project in 2016 without much of a background in um, alcohol and other drug research. So it couldn't have happened without the incredible expertise of the people on the screen. Um, and also the partnerships that we have um, with community controlled health services around the country, um, which are absolutely um, critical to, to this project being able to progress at all. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, um, we probably know, people in the audience probably know that the data from the National Drug Strategy Household Survey indicate that methamphetamine use in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people populations are estimated to be about 2.2 times higher than the general population. Um, and this is particularly in some rural and, and some remote areas. Um, but we also know that Aboriginal people are underrepresented in the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, which we use as a really important source of data. Um, but we do rely on other sources of data as well. And one of those sources is the other Goanna surveys, uh, which were conducted by uh, James's, uh, James's team uh, over a couple of a couple of surveys over, over a few years. Um, and these are large uh, population-based surveys of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people conducted at community events. Um, and in the latest Goanna survey, uh, in line with other, other, other um, surveys that we know of, marijuana was the most commonly used illicit drug. Um, and 35% of the young people surveyed said they'd used it in the last 12 months. In terms of methamphetamine use, 6% of that sample said that they'd used methamphetamine in the, in the last uh, 12 months, which is higher than the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, and may indicate that overall methamphetamine use is a bit underestimated in the population. Uh, in any case, one, some of the things that we do know about methamphetamine use in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, communities is that there's a huge amount of community concern about it, and that it can't be considered um, in isolation from the broader uh, context of social determinants, you know, issues like rates of out-of-home care increasing over recent years, uh, excessive and really unforgivable rates of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander incarceration, um, and a lack of access to healthcare, are really um, features that indicate that there's a, a burden of social harm that falls disproportionately to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, so in this context, uh, the NIMAC project was developed. It was funded by uh, NHMRC. Um, and we also have to thank the National Centre for New and Emerging uh, Research in New and Emerging Drugs as well for some funding for this project. Um, and it was designed uh, with, with, that, with that broader context in mind to look at methamphetamine use from a few different angles. So the first couple of phases of the project were about collecting information. Uh, so we did a large cross-sectional survey and a large qualitative phase of research. And that information was then used to, to inform the more action phases of the, of the research in terms of community-led interventions, focusing on prevention and the development of a web-based treatment tool with the overall aim of strengthening prevention and um, supporting the reduction of methamphetamine use in communities. So to give you a bit of a snapshot of each of those phases, excuse me. <clears throat> um, 
I'll start with the cross-sectional survey. So this was a national survey that took place in the locations that you can see up on the screen there. Um, and the aim of the survey was to really understand patterns of methamphetamine use in each of these communities um, and to understand some of the social context and uh, factors that might be influencing uh, methamphetamine use. So we looked at um, health service use and other risk behaviours and some psycho psychosocial factors as well. Um, in the end, we spoke to more than 700 or well, 734 participants. They were both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. Um, we had more than 50% Aboriginal participants, which we were really pleased with to, to get a good representation of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in that survey. And we spoke to a mix of people who were using methamphetamine very regularly, very frequently, and those who are using uh, less frequently. Um, so what we found in that survey is that methamphetamine use is associated with high rates of psychological distress. Uh, so a quarter of the sample had psycholo psychological distress according to the K10 in the very severe range. It was also associated with exposure to violence. So we found that almost 20% of the sample had been physically violent towards someone in the past four weeks. Um, and almost 25% had been subjected to violence in the past four weeks. And there were more women in that, it was significantly more women in that <clears throat> group. Um, methamphetamine use was also associated with contact with the justice system. Um, and particularly for those who were using more frequently, had a high level of dependence or were diagnosed with a mental disorder. Uh, we found in the in the survey, and this obviously overlaps with um, with James's work, that frequent methamphetamine use and poly drug use were significantly associated um, with involvement in high SDI risk sexual behaviours, um, and having a mental health diagnosis was also associated um, with high SDI risk sexual behaviour. And in our sample, this was particularly pertinent for young women. Um, so young women were twice as likely to report involvement in high SDI risk sexual behaviour if they'd started methamphetamine use earlier and if they, rated, uh, if they had poorer uh, psychological health. And while we found that there, in, in terms of the Aboriginal and the non-Aboriginal participants, there was primarily, uh, there was a huge amount of overlap in terms of the, um, the issues that they highlighted as important um, and the social context of their use. We did find that there were certain factors that were, were clearly more associated or more, more relevant for the Aboriginal participants. So sense of isolation was one of those. So Aboriginal people using methamphetamine, although they mainly lived with their families, they reported um, feeling a greater sense of isolation. Um, so reported that they had no close friends or family to, 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 to turn to, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, we found that experiences of racism were very common. So over 90% said that they experienced racism um, uh, frequently. They were much more likely to have had family taken away by welfare. And they also reported experiences of excessive grief. And these factors were also borne out in the qualitative phase of the research. Um, so we spoke with over 150 people about methamphetamine use, either people who had used themselves, uh, or family members or community members or service providers. And they gave us a really good um, understanding and overview of, of their experiences and perspectives on risk and protective factors in the community. This is a, what you've got on the screen there is a poster that we, um, we had made to summarize the findings on risk and protective factors across the various domains that you can see there. Um, and we found that uh, often the risk and protective factors that we found were, were consistent with those that you might find in other frameworks in the literature. But what was really, really centrally important and underemphasized um, in other frameworks were the, were the factors to do with culture and identity. Um, and these are the factors that, uh, that the communities that, are, that we work with said were really, really fundamentally important and really um, uh, needed to be the focus of, of uh, prevention programs. The other really important thing that came out of the qualitative phase of the research was the clear role that families play in supporting people who are using methamphetamine. And we found that families provide support in a, in a range of different ways, practical, social, emotional, financial, in providing um, or facilitating access to services, and also really importantly, maintaining cultural connection. And we found that they, they um, provided this support often to the detriment of their own social emotional well-being, 
and that really systemically families were not getting the support um, that they felt they needed from the health system and that, and that the support they were providing wasn't being adequately acknowledged. So, so all that data that we collected in those first two phases then went to informing uh, the development of some community-led interventions in five of our partner, partner sites. Um, and you can see up on the screen there that um, the projects that were developed focusing on various risk and protective factors and based on, on the information that we collected in those two phases were really quite different in each of the communities, which is not surprising given they were community-led um, and really focusing on the things that were considered priorities in those communities. However, as we, as we found in the, um, in the qualitative phases, really the important factors that, people, that um, we considered important to focus on were to do with social and cultural connection uh, primarily. So you can see there's a lot of overlap there, a lot of commonalities in the protected, protection and risk factors that were chosen to focus on. Um, so the findings from those first two phases also um, informed the development of a, a web app called We Can Do This. Um, and this app was developed following a really quite extensive process of consultation. So we had a clinical advisory group uh, that advised us on the key components of a, um, uh, of a treatment program that should be included in an app. We had cultural advisors to, to let us know how that should be packaged to, uh, to be culturally relevant and appropriate. Uh, we had a site coordinator group. So I didn't mention earlier, but we had site coordinators in each of the partner communities actually doing the research on the ground, uh, collecting data and facilitating the implementation of the research. So they also had really important input into this development. We had the investigator group and um, really importantly, we had a series of focus groups with and um, a focus groups of people who had experience of use to let us know what was relevant and not relevant and um, look like it was going to work in that web app. And what we ended up with was a, um, a, a, an interactive website, so a web app uh, with seven modules um, tackling different aspects of the recovery journey for people at different stages of change, essentially. Um, so these are all evidence-based and within that, we included narratives from people with experience of use uh, that were filmed to really contextualise that information and um, hopefully make it more, more relevant and relatable. We evaluated the web app in a, in a couple of different ways. Uh, one way was through a randomised trial, uh, which was very challenging. And um, I think uh, the way that the trial was designed was that the app was made available in the community and people could sign up and use it themselves. I mean, I think we can probably safely say, although we're still analysing the data that that wasn't really an effective way for the app to be made available. Um, however, in other aspects of the evaluation, uh, we found that you know, as one component of perhaps a multifaceted sort of treatment program uh, within a, a supported environment, perhaps in a health service, that the app had a, uh, the feedback we got was the app was, uh, it was more useful in that setting. Um, so you can see on the screen there, some of the ways that people uh, were well, some of the things that people said about the app. So the fact that it um, helped at a time when they didn't have a support person to talk to. And certainly that was one of the key reasons for doing an app was if people, it could be, for example, a stopgap if people are waiting to get into a health service or, um, or for whatever reason, geographic, whatever distance, they may not be able to access a service at that time. So having a resource to use in that situation may be useful. Uh, the fact that people felt safe to be open and honest. So it's a little bit anonymous uh, being on an app when people may not feel confident to, um, to, to seek help at that time. However, we also did build in to the app uh, pathways for finding help. So it was really key that, and acknowledged right from the start that an app by itself is not likely to be um, the be all and end all that really seeking help um, and encouraging people to do that and reducing the stigma involved in doing that uh, it was a key sort of um, aim of the app. Um, the, the idea that you could see other people's comments and experiences and perhaps feel that uh, feel not quite so alone um, when, you're, when you're using an app like that, that includes that sort of information. The fact that it fitted well with another participant's value, so the, um, the fact that it was culturally appropriate, um, hopefully made it uh, made this 
participant feel like they were part of something. Um, and the notion that using most people do use phones these days. So, um, so if you are one of those people who does use a phone, it was pretty straightforward to use. Um, so that really summarises the project as a whole. Um, it's still we're still tying up the, the analysis of it. Um, uh, so we may have more to report, I guess, in the future. But I just wanted to finish by um, reflecting back on uh, the beautiful artwork that was created for this project by uh, a young Adelaide artist called Jordan Lovegrove. And the artwork represents the different um, partners in the NIMAC project working together to form a community of practice to um, benefit from the, the source of knowledge which is being, uh, being created by all of us. And I guess I finished there just to um, emphasise, as James said at the beginning, you know, the importance of, of partnerships and working together uh, and really the hope that that will, that, that will continue, that, that, um, that, that learning together. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was extremely informative and covered so many areas on the topic. Uh, we now have a few minutes for questions. Some questions have already come through during the session, but if you do have any burning questions you would like us to answer, please submit it using the Q&A button. Um, got one through now. Um, how can we get our community members more involved in destigmatizing the use of crystal methamphetamine? Um, yeah, look, that's a, that's a really good question. And it was one of the key things that we wanted to, to work towards uh, in the NIMAC project. Um, and I guess one of the ways that we were doing that was through, um, through starting many conversations about it um, and uh, developing these resources, which hopefully really emphasised uh, some of the, uh, or some of the key things about um, methamphetamine use that people may not emphasise so much as in the, the social determinants and those sort of things. Um, I think it's also a matter of making, uh, increasing the capacity of health services to respond in a really helpful way. I think sometimes the stigma um, that people experience in going, to, going for help and so forth is actually based on having had negative experiences in health services. Um, so the more that we can work with health services to be able to provide both culturally appropriate and um, and destigmatizing kind of services, I think, um, the better. James, would you like to say anything about, about that? I think you've covered it off very well. I mean, the discourse that was played out in Australian mainstream media about methamphetamine use, particularly in Aboriginal communities, was pretty confronting and pretty well. And it's no wonder people went underground. And so I think all of those strategies that Rachel just outlined is pretty important to... Um, make it more safe for people to come out with an issue or to talk about it. Um, and it certainly worked in the communities that we have worked with in the past as well, where we've talked with communities and we've talked with health service providers and users themselves um, around these issues. And so I think, yeah, Aboriginal people were portrayed very negatively and uh, stigmatised um, during the Big Ice campaign. I think it was in the lead up to the last federal election, to be honest, uh, um, or the or um, when, um, when Aboriginal um, targeted with, um, uh, by media. Uh, we have a question from Rob. The communities reached, are they too unique or to be applied to other communities, say Newcastle, Hunter, Eric? Uh, for the NIMAC project. So the communities reached, I think, I mean, James, you could probably speak to this when the project was developed, we were really the ones that put up their hands to, to be involved. Um, they ended up being mostly regional communities. Um, and although they're very diverse, I think you can safely say that there are commonalities of experience, which means that hopefully the things we found are more generalizable uh, than that. Again, James, I'll throw to you in case you wanna no, add all good. Yep. to that. Yep, yep. <laughs> Tammy said, I'm in Darwin. Did your research isolate the drug use in each area specifically? I'm curious to know how Darwin stands against the rest of the nation. Oh, so in the early phases of the project, we did work with Danila Dilba Health Service. 
Um, but I think really probably the numbers, although we provided a report back to Daniela Dilber about what they found in Darwin, um, probably numbers are a bit too small to make really big claim, claims about what we know about, about drug use in, um, in that region. Um, yeah, so. And Melanie said, have we tried running a trial of contingency management that has shown increase in abstinence in American studies? Did you see the benefits to this approach in the future? Um, oh, look, that's not something that I'm an expert in. I have heard about contingency management and the fact that, uh, that it has been effective. I think I've heard Rebe Rebecca McKeaton, one of our investigators, talk a little bit more about it. And um, I think there are barriers to doing it in Australia um, in terms of like, so it means you pay people to, uh, to remain abstinent, uh, abstinent <laughs> in their drug use. Um, pardon me. So... Uh, I guess I'd probably want to refer to her expertise in, in understanding more about that. Um, but she has talked about the fact that it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't seem to be a popular approach here, probably for a number of reasons that need to be explored further. But it does seem to have potential for sure. Yeah, and I think we just would, if we were to run a trial like that, we'd do an extensive consultation with communities about its appropriateness and and, uh, and the impact, you know, the thing that we need to be mindful about, you know, like whether you're incentivised people or you don't incentivise, incentives are a pretty uh, uh, charged issue, you know, like if you're incentivised for one issue, are we going to, our community going to expect to be incentivised for every other issue? And so it's, uh, um, these things need to be very, considered very carefully, but in the greater um, scheme of things with, uh, uh, when you're working with uh, communities that are, already marginalised and, um, and have quite a lot of stigma and, and other issues involved in their communities. And Sherry wanted to know how sites were selected for the study. Can I throw to you for that, James? That was early on. Uh, so we started this study when the big hype was on the, um, on the in media. And we basically, uh, communities asked us to uh, actually, for the large part, communities approached us and asked us to do something about methamphetamines. Um, and then we used other people in contacts uh, around Australia uh, to participate in the study. But the majority of people um, came to us and said, can we do something about methamphetamines uh, in, in communities? Christine asked, is the app We Can Do This now available to the general population or was it only for research participants? Um, it's just undergoing a bit of a review uh, phase, but we certainly do aim to make it um, available again soon. Uh, based on all the feedback that we've got through the evaluation, we'll just refine it a little bit and then uh, relaunch. Rachel, what helped facilitate the undertake of the app and do you think you could better evaluate it in the future? Sorry, what helped? Sorry, can you... What was the first part? Um, what helped facilitate the uptake of the app and how do you think you could better evaluate it in the future? Yeah, so uptake of the app was, a, was one of the really big challenges. Um, and I think this is true across the board for web apps that are designed for all sorts of um, all sorts of purposes. Uh, some of the things that we found that helped facilitate it were having health service involvement. Um, also, so having it, it being used in a supported environment where, they, where, a health serv where a clinician, for example, might encourage someone to use it. Um, also uh, peers. So uh, where, where peers would encourage, you know, who are trusted people within the, within the networks would encourage someone to, to take it up and use it. That was helpful. And also family, actually. Um, so if there was a family member who came across it and thought it might be really good. So in general, it was having other people to, to facilitate its use thing. We did also have a Facebook page and we got a little bit of engagement that way. Um, 
yeah, but in general, it was, a, it was definitely a really big challenge. And I think something that we'd like to look at um, more uh, and probably, you know, in the future in terms of better evaluation, I think probably aim to put, to house the app within a supportive environment. You know, it's a, it's a, it's an evidence-based culturally appropriate resource, which I think can add, be a really important piece of the puzzle um, for some people and, and within certain health, within health services. Um, so I think we'll, we'll um, aim to look further and evaluate it in that setting. So, and there's another question that came through. How do you encourage community engagement in health promotion programs? My health service has a high turnover of health staff. Hard for the Indigenous community to develop trust with the health system. I might use, for uh, example, the Young Daddy Free project that uh, we uh, worked on um, over a number of years, and the resources are still on a uh, on a, uh, a website called youngdaddyfree.org.au. Um, so basically, this was a a major health promotion program uh, trying to raise awareness among young people about STIs across remote Australia. We were working with four um, four main jurisdictions, Queensland, Northern Territory, South Australia and WA. Um, and basically, if you think about the diversity in those communities and uh, the spread of those communities, they're pretty diverse. And uh, um, we were in the thick of a syphilis outbreak and so we kind of developed a... Uh, and we already had four or five cases of women diagnosed with syphilis during pregnancy as a result of this outbreak that was occurring in Queensland. So we did a, an ad in, um, uh, we, we produced an ad with some small funding we received from the health department. Um, and it was really about the dangers of test, oh, well, making sure you get tested during pregnancy because uh, you might lose your baby. And it was kind of, it's still up there. It's still one of the uh, most popular resources we've developed. But because it was made in South Australia, the people in far north Queensland kind of said they're not our people. Um, they're not our. They're not our people. And so we got smarter uh, down the track. And we kind of uh, what we did was we just you know that's a huge number of communities and quite you know quite noticeable variation in the way people look and and across those communities. Whether you're from far north Queensland or you're from uh, WA. And, and even the landscapes change uh, big time. So what we did was uh, we picked a few sites in each of those jurisdictions and we went to those sites and we uh, worked with local communities to develop uh, resources um, and messaging and uh, involve communities in the development of resources around sexual health. Um, and we in, not only involved young people, but we involved parents and we involved elders and we involved clinicians in each of those sites. We went, I think we went to six sites um, and uh, and really what we did in the end, when you're trying to put a health promotion campaign to remote communities, we did some clever stuff. Um, one of them was a 30 second ad where you just had headshots. So you'd have somebody from far North Queensland and then you'd have someone from South Square, someone from uh, uh, the Kimberley with the background of the Boab tree, for instance, all in the same ad. So it's everybody in remote Australia uh, talking about the same issue in a 30 second ad it's possible all of those resources are on the young daddy free uh, website and there are hundreds of resources that we developed under that project some of them are very simple infographics some of them are uh, animations some are um, small videos and some uh, yeah a lot of small videos for the three minutes five minutes and what we tend to do now is uh, pump out those resources um, every day on social media, on Young Daddy Free Facebook page and uh, and Twitter and Instagram, and uh, and it's worked really well. It's like one of the firstly, it was one of the largest sexual health campaigns to target remote communities. Two, it addresses a very taboo topic that had never been discussed openly before, and three, it addressed significant diversity across um, jurisdictions and across those communities. And four, it involved everyone from young people themselves to uh, parents and aunties and uncles and, uh, and healthcare clinicians and even elders are involved in some of the videos that we've got up on the, on the screen. We used local people to put the messages and that often involved uh, uh, humour and it often involved um, um, serious sides, but yeah, the young pe people involved in those messages, whole, whole suite of resources um, 
videos, posters, uh, animations, uh, infographics. So yeah, we're still being widely used everywhere in remote Australia today. And as a health professional working on the ground, what is the major take home message regarding ice usage among Indigenous individuals that you would like us to walk away with? Uh, yeah, you go, Rachel, first, and I'll go. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess the main thing, I well, a couple of things that I've come away with, uh, just understanding the complexity of people's lives. And I'm sure if you're someone sort of working on the ground, um, you, you would see that, you know, that ice use is just one, one part of probably some other underlying sort of issues and that they're, they're um, ultimately related to things like complex trauma and and we, that's, I think, as yet still under-acknowledged within the health system. So I think that's a really important uh, message to have out there. I guess the other clear message and one that we need to explore further is the, the role, the impact on and the role of families and how we um, work better to support to support families uh, who, are, who are affected by methamphetamine use. Uh, what do you think, James? No, I think that they're, they're great. Um, yeah, the complexity, the, the social and structural determinants that are at play in people's lives is pretty important. Um, and making sure our health services are aware of and uh, um, and are open to the conversation of raising um, the issue of methamphetamine use in communities. The other big thing I would say, it's not only people using methamphetamines, often people are using poly drugs uh, at the same time. And so... Um, making sure interventions or strategies when you're dealing with alcohol and other drugs uh, are broad enough to not just narrow in on one uh, particular topic at one point in time. Awesome. Um, thank you, Professor Warren and Dr. Riley. Sadly, this is all we have time for today. I'd like to thank you for your time and sharing such valuable insights with us. Apologies to anyone who didn't have their questions answered today. You're more than welcome to get in touch with us via email and we will respond to any questions or inquiries as soon as possible. We will be holding more webinars and putting new resources on Cracks in the Ice website throughout the year. So I would encourage you to subscribe to our mailing list at cracksintheice.org.au to receive further updates. Thank you again for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.